My name is Sage Francis. Get out of here! <laughs> You're watching the B Shine. You can come in. I was fucking with you. The mere fact that I loved hip hop. Um, the first time I heard hip hop, I loved hip hop. So when you're a kid, if you like something, you immediately involve yourself yourself in it. That's, I mean, that's what I see with kids. That's how it was like when I was a kid. I remember the Fat Boys tape, the first Fat Boys album was floating around my school and they said fuck on the tape. It was, it was like, ooh, like everyone was like, passing along pornography to each other by sharing the tape you know but it was it was the beats it just was the rhymes it was the general attitude it was the sounds it was like so brand new and so what i just hated like i was bored of everything else around me i don't know if i was bored but for some reason that just was like a fresh new sound and i started writing raps immediately i started recording myself immediately i just wanted to be involved right away i just rapped and fucking wrote diss songs, wrote sex raps, wrote horrorcore, was emulating my favorite MCs, you know, just being in front of people with a crowd when I was 12 years old and holding a microphone was a magical experience. Getting to the talent shows and at clubs or at block parties and being an out of towner because I didn't come from like, I mean, Rhode Island in general is a small state, but I came from a small town in a small state, and we'd have to go to Providence to <clears throat> join in on the rap festivities. And so no one knew who I was once I would step into these battles. And then I had kind of already honed my skills, and they were sharp. And I blew these crowds away, and they just went wild. And it just was like that feeling of winning over a crowd based on execution of like rap styles was it's like all i ever wanted so it definitely fueled my desire to keep doing it though i never really thought i'd have a career because i didn't even know i mean white rappers weren't a thing really i mean i knew i'd always do it but i didn't think i'd make money off it i didn't think i'd be making albums or running my own record label all that stuff came further down the line because I, I mean 12 13 14 15 year, years old i'm still wondering hey is a label gonna sign me how does this work how, what's a manager what is, how, how does all this stuff work and i just had to figure it out bit by bit through the years and by the time i got through college i still didn't know i was still trying to figure it out but at least i had access to the college radio station and that gave me access to a wider audience who were all tuning in because at the time when people listen to college radio for the new hip hop you can get it online now but back then it was like you had to actually wait for the dj to play the song you wanted to hear it's you couldn't download it anywhere um and we were the first ones to be playing all this stuff but beyond just playing new records we used it as a format to obviously self-promote because we were like rapping at every chance we you know we people would come up we battle at the station or we'd freestyle at the station and then people started hearing my name i'd go to the battles and win and thankfully like that raised my recognition level as well and yeah a lot of things came together at the right time because had i only been known as a battle rapper i might have been stuck inside of that kind of box that a lot of battle rappers do get stuck inside of because they see them, you know, you can make money, you make a name that way, but the limitations are there as far as what you can do with your career. Um, so I was lucky, I did, got to do that. I was doing shows, had the radio, was doing freestyles, was had the poetry stuff happening too because the spoken word scene was kind of booming at the time and it was a kind of a new approach to how to like express yourself on stage in different, just acapella styles, you know, so. Um, any excuse to get in front of a microphone, <laughs> I, I took it. And uh, hip hop was always the the driving force from th as soon as I heard it. I was eight years old. I just consumed as much of it as I could, learned as much as I could. And I obviously was limited as to what kind of information or even music I could access. But thankfully, even as a kid, we had 88.9 in Boston, WERS had uh the rap explosion on saturday nights and 95.5 wbru in providence on sundays had the black experience and sound and they had the grinch and chameleon show on sundays and <clears throat> i think that was an hour show or maybe that was two hours but they played all the new stuff um 
and a lot of MCs came through. I still have tapes of, I still have tapes. I recorded all that stuff as a kid because like anything you could get, you'd want to save. There's so little things for you to listen to at that point, pre-internet. So yeah, yeah. I, I was an archivist of, of Rhode Island college radio stuff. My family weren't a part of equa the equation when I did that because I kept it secret for the most part. I didn't want them to know I was pursuing anything. In fact, I don't even think they heard... I don't think my family heard anything official until my f until personal journals dropped. So that was years after I had started. I, it's just not something I shared with them because I didn't want them to be a reason I didn't say or do certain things and I didn't want them to feel like they had any responsibility and like swaying me one way or the other you know like I just I wanted that out of the equation as an artist I really wanted a total total freedom of thought and expression and not feel like I have to look out for you know oh I hope he doesn't think this is about him or shit like that it was like and I also, I was just, I'm a weirdo like that. Like I keep a lot of things secret. I, I mean, it's, it's just, I, when I was a kid, if I got in trouble, they would take my rap tapes away, you know, or, you know, so like at a certain point I learned, okay, never, you know, try to be careful about what you share or what you, what people know about you. So they don't take it away if, if they want, <laughs> you know, you, the lessons you learn as an eight year old, you, you carry on into late adulthood. They've seen the career develop. They've seen me go from, you know, having nothing to now I own the house and run a record label. They see the success in it. So that, that's always good. Like once you've shown success, once you've shown you can pay your bills with what you do, then they lose their leverage as far as what they can really say about your career or music. So that was good. But they've, they've been super supportive. And my mom obviously is like super important to me. She taught me how to rhyme. Um, I, she, she likes when I give her that credit. Um, and my grandmother is one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And she's cool about it too. I mean, they're not the thing. The other thing is they're not hip hop fans. So I'm not like, I don't like making them feel like they need to enjoy it. If they just don't like, they like it. Cause it's me. Cool. Playing the shows with public enemy who they're, you know, Chuck D has been my hero since as my, the first time I saw them live, which was I was 12 years old, was at the Run DMC concert. They opened up along with EPMD and DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. And LL Cool J made an appearance, but Public Enemy. As much as I loved all their tape, like I had all their tapes, I loved I loved all those groups. Public Enemy was the one that just hit me so hard. It just stuck with me through the years. And he's still Chuck D's still one of the last of. <laughs> the heroes of uh, when I was a kid who hasn't let me down in any way. It's like, I still kind of look up to him. Like, I still want to be his intern, you know? I would still kind of like, if he wanted me to do his laundry, I probably would, you know, as long as he tells me stuff while I'm doing it. Um, so playing the show with Public Enemy, a few shows and having him chat it up with me at the lunch table and, you know, like, he knows my music and, you know, for him to give me respect and, you know, salute and this and that that's to me it was like i could die right now I'm, I'm all right the first one was overcoming the white rap doesn't work thing like they no one wanted to hear from a white rapper those boundaries were broken down by many people but like through the years i always had to encounter that um and letting people see past the color at a certain point and not say okay i'm listening to a white perspective like for me to get beyond in my writing and how I express myself for it to, to be beyond the voice of just a white, straight white male, like to represent much more than that has been my goal and something I've always wanted to overcome. And I think I have, if I haven't, fuck it, I'll still keep trying, but that's, that was one, but the, on the, the very simple level, it was the white guy thing. White people can't rap. Well, then we, you know, we had to just keep pushing harder and harder. And obviously people like Eminem who came up and, with a great display of skill, um, though a lot of people in that era had tons of skill and like the white hip hop was like under wraps, like the industry just didn't want to address it. You know, like underground hip hop in 99, 98 was like, it just, I was surprised to find out how, how many artists were white. It was crazy because like we didn't, again, it was not, it was before internet, before a lot of access to pictures and 
um, videos and stuff like that. So all you knew was the songs. And a lot of people didn't know I was white when, when certain stuff comes out. People think I'm crazy when I say that because they think I, you know, I do have a crazy, stupid white voice. But um, <laughs> people still would be surprised to find out that I was white. And I just like I was surprised to find out other artists were white once years went on and then i saw a picture of him i was like no shit Are you kidding me 2014 i think overcoming more on the business side of thing me business side of things me trying to figure out how to do everything with with as much integrity as possible not use cheat codes <laughs> and still make the kind of music that i love and music that pushes me but I want to be able to access more people. How do you do that without like buying into a system that is built to crush indies and built to crush like people who just come up with their own voice and their own unique original stuff, unless you play by their rules and you pay certain people to do certain things. It's like, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that. I'm most proud that I can travel anywhere I want. Usually, um, that's a great privilege. Uh, just to think of a place I want to go and usually I'm able to do a show there because there are fans there so probably the greatest perk of my career yeah that's just like a wonderful thing where like I'd like to see Iceland like can I go there yeah can I make money while I'm there yeah you know I can I come home and pay my bills still yeah so to me that's it's probably all I could have ever wanted <laughs> As long as I can still maintain my lifestyle at home, if I can keep my house. I mean, I'm obviously happy I was able to buy a house and have a car. But, like, those are the... I don't buy a lot. Like, I don't I don't need a lot of nice things. I, In fact, I don't have many nice things, and the house is falling apart. But um, it's it's working for the most part. Whatever, whatever legacy I'm building right now, fuck it. I don't give a shit. I, like, I just give my all have fun try to have fun in the process push my limitations make people realize damn not too many people could have done that shit respect that's good enough for me